But the big thing is just don't like there's so much information and, and you can you can dive deep into this. Don't get overwhelmed. Just get a bow, go out, shoot some arrows, have fun. And, you know, don't get frustrated that you will get frustrated, but try, you know, just just go out and have fun. All right, everybody, we are back now with Clay still. He's still with us, um, so that's a good sign. Mark and I haven't completely driven him mad yet. Um, but and, and actually, Mark and I get to show off our bows. If you're watching on, uh, on video right now, we have them here. They've, they've dried from their spar urethane treatment. We've given them a couple of coatings. We'll probably end up giving them more when we get back home. But uh, this is kind of how they've turned out. And Clay has been helping us attempting to help us learn how to shoot these things um, because there's there's just a lot of unique little oddities and quirks to shooting a traditional bow and doing it well and um, you know I think uh, I think it's one of those things that nobody can really ever say that they've perfectly mastered like many things on earth um, at least hopefully that would make me feel a little bit better if, if, if that were the case but um, what's the fun in completely mastering it Jim that's right that's right then the challenge is gone you gotta find something else but uh, but the challenge I would say certainly is not gone even uh, even for Clay um, because we've gone out and we we were stump shooting a lot today we were, we were tuning bows that's something we got to talk about today we did a little stump shooting we'll explain what that is and uh, a lot of learning along the way about form and and even just the arrows themselves all kinds of stuff and then in also, maybe how we would wind up using them in a hunting setting. Clay's explained a lot of that because he's he's used these bows in tons of different hunts. Uh, and so, yeah, what um, Clay? Maybe I guess where we'd start here. What is unique to shooting a traditional bow uh, versus a uh, versus a I guess compound has almost become like the new traditional in some ways because everybody's using it. It's like, um, well. A compound has a lot of different features on it that are designed to reduce variability and basically take you as much as possible out of the shot. Uh, a traditional bow doesn't have any of that stuff, and so you have to rely on yourself to make you know every part of the shot, from drawing the bow to uh, making sure you're at the same draw length every time, making sure everything's aligned, um, aiming everything. It's, uh, um, it's very, very... There's a lot of uh, overlap as far as like form and things go. Um, okay. The fundamentals of archery are the same, uh, but there's also you know a lot of differences as well. I think we've uh, I think we've pinpointed the problem, Jim. I'm too involved in the shot. There's too much me. <laughs> if if only we could take it out. Well, then we'll just be right back to where you are with the bow that you normally shoot, which is your compound. Um, but, uh, Mark, you've shot a lot of compound. I've never shot a compound bow in my life, so I can't even necessarily speak to that. But um, you'll, be our, you'll be our go-to guy to speak to that. Um, but, you know, obviously when you're shooting a traditional bow, there's no, you don't have a peep sight on the string. You don't have pins. You don't have any of that sort of thing. So I think a lot of people probably zoom in on that right away. They're like, they kind of forget all the other stuff they have to do with the tri bow. You know, it's, it's like, well, first off, how am I going to aim the thing? Clay, maybe you can explain that for us, um, too. And then, uh, but, but then there's also just how you have to hold it, how you have to draw it. Um, what do you, what do you tell somebody? What do most people ask you first? Is it usually how am I going to aim the thing, or is it how do I hold the thing and draw it back? I don't know. There, a lot of people have questions about aiming because it's not, you know, with a compound, it's it's easy to understand. You know, you have if they, they've shot a gun before so they have a front sight they have rear sights they understand how those things line up um, and help you hit a target and it's the same with the compound your rear sights your peep and your front sights your pin line them up and the arrow goes to the target um, with a traditional bow obviously you don't have those things and so people have questions about aiming but it's really it's not any different your sights are just not as readily uh, apparent Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the, there's a couple of different ways or a couple of different schools on how to shoot these bows. Um, you have the, the kind of instinctive crowd and that's what, when it comes to traditional archery, that's what most people, uh, who aren't into traditional archery are familiar with because that's probably what they've heard it described as 
throwing a baseball. And you made that reference earlier while we were out in the field. Uh, you don't have to know the yardage to uh, your receiver to throw him a football. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of that instinctive style of shooting where you don't really, you don't have any conscious refer reference points. You don't have any aiming aids. Um, and through repetition, you can get a feel for, it's really, you're, you're using your sight picture. So if you think about when you draw a compound bow and shoot, you kind of get a feel for how that looks, you know, at a distance. And if you're, if you're shooting a single pin compound, uh, that's an even better analogy because like your pin might not be exactly on what you want to hit. Maybe you're raising it a little above or a little below. So those are, those are all sight pictures. Um, and so with instinctive shooting, you know, you just get a feel for how that shot feels to you and let it rip. Uh, I shot that way for a long time, a long time, like 10 years and never was able to develop a level of consistency that I was happy with. Uh, I would go through these big, um, swings in my shooting. So I would have some, sometimes when I would really be like on, uh, and then I'd have some times where it was like, you know, I couldn't hit a hay bale at 10 yards. And mm -hmm. it's when you go through those time, those types of swings, it's maddening. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I eventually got to the point where I, I wanted to find a more, for me, I wanted to find a more consistent way of shooting. And so I started paying attention to how to aim these bows. Um, and so with, with the type of aiming that I use, I describe it as something called gap shooting. But the type of shooting that I really do is kind of a hybrid between gap shooting and instinctive. So in pure gap shooting, you're using, you're basically using your arrow's tip as a, in the same way that you would use a pin on a compound, on a single pin compound. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're using that, like I said earlier, you know, with a single pin compound, you may not be exactly on what you want to hit. You may be a little above or a little below. And so you have a gap with that compound pin. It's the same way with the, the arrow's point, you just, the gap's just bigger, right? Because it's not in your line of sight. Okay. It's a little bit below. And so to hit the target uh, using that method, you would just place your tip somewhere below the target depend and, and w how far below is going to depend on your distance from the target. And I have videos on my YouTube channel that, that like break that down and I give visual, you know, I show how, what that looks like. And so it can, it can help, uh, people to understand exactly what I'm talking about. Um, what else, what, were, what, what else did you, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. So the, the gap sort of thing that you talked about there, well, first off, I think it's the one, the one thing you brought up at some point is that instinctual shooting, it still is relying on that sight picture. It's not necessarily as though y you couldn't shoot in the dark. I think you said at a laser pointer pointing at the wall yeah. instinctively, you'd have to have some frame of reference. So yeah. even it's just, it's just not necessarily conscious to that shooter. It's they've done it so many times through repetition, whatever that they just sort of know what that has to look like yeah. and what they have to do. And then that's, the, that's the big difference between uh, instinctive shooting and the, the type of shooting that I do, which is what I call a split vision type mm -hmm. of shooting. I'm conscious of my arrow's point in relation to that target. So if someone who shoots instinctively would be, although they're still using the sight picture, they're doing it subconsciously. They're not conscious, consciously using their arrow tip to aim that. Okay. Bow. Got it. And so the, just to further explain what the difference between gap shooting, like gap, you know, at 20 yards, you have a, whatever your gap is, say, let's say 15 inches. So at 20 yards, you're, you would put your arrow's point 15 inches below what you want to hit. Mm -hmm. With split vision shooting, I'm not like the, the exact number of inches below doesn't matter to me. I'm using that sight picture. And when I draw back at a specific distance, like I know just what it looks like. Sure. And so the gap itself becomes somewhat instinctive, but I'm still aware of my arrow's tip. I still use that to line up my left and right. Okay. Got it. And you're focusing on the target. Yes. So you're not focusing on the arrow. Yeah. You're not looking at your arrow. You're just aware of it in your peripheral vision. It becomes kind of like a, uh, it's reminiscent of a red dot in some ways. If you use a red dot on a carbine or on a pistol, those are specifically made 
that a shooter would be able to focus on the target and not on their reticle, um, which is one of the drawbacks to like old school iron sights. It's it's funny how in in a way there with red dots we've advanced in order to get to a traditional style in in some ways or a more intuitive style of aiming that the human wants to use, whereas irons. Everybody is always talking about focus on the front sight, front sight, front sight, and so the picture's blurred out, or you're trying to switch between three different planes. I I was uh, I was thinking earlier on that that uh, that parallel was a bit odd. Yeah. But yeah, to Clay, tell me. So what you describe with that split vision really seems to me like what I was experiencing out there, at least attempting to try and do. And uh, when I was uh, shooting like probably like at 10 yards i feel like i was about you know, like 10 to 15 inches below the target about 30 yards i was point on mm-hmm. and then above that i was really like sometimes i'd try and pick a point for those longer shots but also it's kind of like you know jim's football analogy it's kind of like i don't know this just feels right yeah <laughs> and when you start stretching out like you know those those 80 and 100 yard shots you know i you don't shoot that enough to know really where you should be holding. So you just, you just pick out something up there that kind of looks right and let her, let her rip. Um, and then, but if you, if you take a shot like that, let's say you were shooting at 80 yards, Mm -hmm. you pick out something, some frame of reference, maybe the halfway up a pine tree way behind the target, you make that shot and let's say you're, you're short. Well, if you remember where you picked, well, you just pick a higher point the next time, yeah. and you can you can actually walk arrows into the target. Uh, and I think it was two or three years ago, I did a video that you can find on my website where I was shooting. Uh, I shot a three D deer target at a hundred yards, and I put two out of three arrows in the target, and and then I was shooting at eighty yards, and I think I put th- all three of them in the target. Wow! Shoot. Just because I. You know, I had to, I had to, uh, when I was shooting at a hundred, I had to walk those arrows in. I think I shot one arrow that was short. I shot one that was a little closer and the third one hit it. And then on the next one, I, I put all of them in it because I had my point. I had, I knew where I was supposed to be holding my bow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like you were bringing up Mark the, and, and you alluded to earlier, Clay, the gap, so to speak, in this case for your arrow between the target, um, that changes. And so you end up with, it's kind of, I always had, like, I keep bringing things back to rifle scopes and whatnot, because that's what I'm so familiar with and shooting, but it's a little bit of that sort of sight over bore mm-hmm. kind of height thing that you're dealing with, um, and uh, when you're basically point blank on a target, you would just put the point right on the target. It's it's a no-brainer, right? That point's going to go right there. As you move back, that's where the gap becomes wider and wider going down. And then there's a certain point where it starts to come back up until it's point on again. Yep. And you said for your bow, I think that was somewhere between like 35 and 40 yards or so. Yeah, it depends on the arrows, the you know, the weight of the arrows. It depends oh, right, on the bow okay. and arrow combination. Um, and I can't remember. Uh, it's It's been a little while since I shot this bow and arrow combination. But I want to say like... When you find your point on and you're shooting well, you, like you know exactly, it's like 42 yards or 38 yards or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And it is, uh, and that, like you said, so that's arrow dependent. Yep. Mm-hmm. Kind of. So you, you, do you ever shoot out of your one bow? Do you find yourself then shooting different arrow setups that have different point on distances? Or if I shoot, um, I mean, I try to make all my arrows pretty close to the same weight. I mean, they'll be right around 640 grains total weight. Um, and so it's it, it's usually pretty pretty consistent. Mm-hmm. Okay, I got it. So there's not like maybe you're going to go on a different hunt, so you're going to swap to no. a completely different arrow. Like maybe somebody would swap to a completely different bullet out of a gun for something. Oh, you know. sure. But, okay, got it. What about um, What about grip? We talked a little bit about grip and you were showing me some things like what do you like how are you shooting your bow how do you like your hand position what you know pressure points things like that yeah so when i hold my bow very little of my hand is actually contacting the bow i mean basically it's just the base of my thumb my my lower palm is not touching the bow at all i mean it's it's coming off my hands, uh, like coming off the bow at about a 45 like that. So if I hold my hand up and I make a V with my forefinger and my thumb, that's 
that's about the uh, the angle that mm-hmm. I'm holding this bow if it was straight up and down like that. And so when I draw that bow, it pushes all that all that pressure right at the base of my thumb, which lines up and shoots that pressure right up my arm, right through my shoulder, and if I have my alignment right, to my drawing elbow. Got it. Yeah, that's definitely something that I was having a little bit of trouble with was getting my alignment right. And you're really, I mean, you're using a lot of your bone structure there, aren't you? Yeah, that bone structure, you know, there's... There are people who can shoot uh, very well, like snap shooting, um, and not. I mean, they don't. Their their alignment. They don't have the alignment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, it's important, you know, to have that good alignment and use your skeletal structure. It's it's easier for me to to reach a level of consistency, um, you know, versus just uh, snap shooting. You know, where you're coming back, hitting full draw, and letting her rip. Um, but I mean, like I said, there's there's a, there's different people who shoot different ways, and, and some of them shoot really well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then as far as, like, you know, wrapping your hand, you know, it's not like you're giving it, like, a death grip. Oh, I mean, no. you're really just, it's almost like your pointer finger is just almost just resting on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, I've shot with, uh, sometimes in competition shoots, you'll see guys with wrist slings on their bows. Okay. Or finger slings. It's basically just a a piece of uh, paracord that goes from this finger to this finger. And so they can shoot with a completely relaxed, open grip. Oh, and not drop the bow. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've done that. I've experimented with that before. And it, I, I do shoot better with one because whenever you shoot your bow, it's an, you instinctively grab it. Yeah. And that, in, that introduces variability into mm-hmm. your shot. Every time you do that, you can't do it the exact same every single time. So yeah, very similar to, um, I found in, in practicing shooting is very similar to shooting a pistol. Um, like when we did the pistol training with those guys at edge, mm-hmm. it's, it's easy to draw your bow back. You've got it back. You're looking at it and you're like, boy, that point looks really good right now. And yeah. then you, and then you, you do something immediately right as the arrow is getting ready to release and you change where it's pointed and then it goes yep. obviously not where you wanted it to go. Um, so I imagine, like you said, that, that instinctual squeezing motion, that whole hand kind of grab at the handle really messes you up. Um, what about your, your release with your string hand? What does that look like? Well, ideally you want your shot to break cleanly, um, without any inputs at all. Uh, you know, you can, you can have, you can spend a lot of effort setting things up. You know, you have good form, good alignment, uh, you're on target. And if you can get your shot to break cleanly then and let the bow do its job, your shot's going to be good. But the trick with traditional, it, you don't have a release where you can... Oh, come apart. Two-piece <laughs> bow here. That's intentional. Yeah, design that way. It's <laughs> designed that way. Um, you know, with a compound, you have that trigger. You, you can slowly squeeze that thing until your shot breaks. Um, and, and with traditionally you don't have that. And so a lot of times, and this is something that I've struggled with forever is you anticipate you like, like you said that everything's lined up and then you do something. Right. And when you do something, you introduce this variability and that might be grip in the bow. That might mm-hmm. be maybe a slight collapse or something like that. The trick is to do nothing and just let that shot execute. Gosh, I'm seeing more and more why Pete, one of our instructors at Edge, just always says he's like, the best people who come in and start shooting pistol are archers because they're so good at doing exactly that. There are there are some parallels. So when you're when you're getting that release, are you you're not are you just continuing to pull back on the string and then changing your finger angle so it just slips off? Or what's going like what's happening when that string I during that process, I guess. I don't know that I could honestly. I don't know that I could tell you exactly like what I do, other than not hold anymore, not hold it. Okay. Um, yeah. It, like sometimes you just gotta let go. <laughs> That's sometimes right. Sometimes you just gotta That's let right. go. Um, you know, the biggest thing is to not collapse, not creep forward on that shot, and that's what so many people do is when it comes time to release they it's like an active like a like a flinch almost yeah um and the trick is to not not let that back tension to go not creep forward but to maintain that back tension and when you have a good break in your release 
your wrist will come straight back over like and, and touch your shoulder. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is hard to explain what happens exactly there. Um, but uh, on that, I mean, you've mentioned being aligned. You mentioned, you know, and you just brought up back tension. And I feel like after all the stump shooting that we've done today, I've got a little back tension going right now since I haven't shot these uh, at my trad bow in a while. But, um, you know, one thing I think that people underestimate is is if you're moving over from compound bow, this is, again, something that I just I see is obviously you have that initial draw weight and then a compound bow with that, then you get it where it's nice and easy after the initial draw weight that you can pull it back and you can kind of hang out there for a while. And you can get everything just right. One of the tough things with traditional bow is that it's heavy the whole time. And yeah, so there's no to, let off. You're trying to hold it back there and it starts adding up. If you hold it back long, you know, a long time, it'll start adding up. Then you start getting a little shakier, and, and you might have to draw down in order to sort of get yourself reset if you haven't been able to get it off just right. Um, but that, that makes it kind of tough. I know, Mark, you were, I think it was just a little bit of like a weird change at first for you because it seemed like, you know, you were trying to do the old compound bow thing where you give it a good heave, and then you're going to figure it out later. Right. Instead well, of and that's a, and that's probably me just even you know compensating even when I shoot a compound just knowing hey once I get it over that hump I can kind of do whatever I do whatever I want you know mm-hmm. and and I think uh, you know with this I mean honestly I mean it's probably a case of just being a little bit overbowed like I don't think I've got these muscles you know developed enough so that's something that I definitely want to work on but I mean you're you're absolutely right Jim I mean getting those back muscles engaged and that's what clay was you know trying to point out whether i ever got there but um was that and then also another thing that's interesting that clay touched on earlier was you know on a compound you have that back wall Mm -hmm. which this i mean i guess in some ways has a back wall but it's not like in a it's not a stop yeah the like i have when i reach full draw it's almost like a, a wall on a compound because when I have when I have full draw and alignment, I can feel that muscle underneath my shoulder blade like knotted up, and I kn- that's like almost part of my anchor, um, mm-hmm. and so I know that I'm at full draw and it's 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 locked in like it ro- it rotates around and like cams in and it's it's there. I'm not drawing any farther than that. Yeah, but once it takes a little while to to get the feel for, for, for what that feels like. Cause I can do it. I can shoot a lightweight bow left-handed and I don't get that. Like, I don't know what that feels like. Cause that muscle's not developed yet. Hmm. Now, does that happen with, uh, does your anchor point have anything to do with that as far as where your hand ends up like on your face? I know a lot of people who shoot traditional bow, they talk about having a specific anchor point. Like it might be the, uh, some middle finger, first knuckle on the canine tooth, with me, I put like the first knuckle of my thumb just behind like my chin and underneath my ear. Does that have anything to do with that drawback point, or is that all mostly in the back? And that that anchor point is a different thing. Well, yeah, I mean your anchor, like like for for instance, my anchor point. I take my index finger and I put it all, right on the cheekbone right here, okay. and then my the bowstring will come across my brow. So when I have those two points, it's it. I know that I'm at that same point. But I can I can reach that anchor point and not yet be aligned. Hmm. So okay. you can reach that anchor point just through wrenching that thing back with your bicep. But then it takes a, a rotation around your body to get that alignment. And then that's when that, that back muscle really gets engaged and I can feel it in my back. Yeah. I found that doing that too... The times where I would notice that I was missing to the side, like my distance might have been good, my hold on there might have been good, but I was missing to the side. There's a whole lot of reasons I'm sure that it could be going on. Um, but I found that one of the ways that I would sort of fix that was making sure that I wasn't just kind of getting to that anchor point and not getting fully aligned. And then also when I would get fully aligned, I found that I could get my my eye more directly over the arrow. Mm-hmm. And before, if you're not quite fully aligned, your elbow's not fully back, and you're not locked in with that back tension, your eye is, at least mine, being a right-handed shooter, was a bit off to the left, kind of, of the arrow. It wasn't over the top, and mm. I had a feeling that I was kind of inducing some, some parallax error, basically, with that. And I was I was aiming my left and right off of a, a different vantage yeah. point than the arrow was actually pointed. Yeah, Yeah, that makes perfect sense. 
What about Got it? Nailed what, it. <laughs> let's say uh, purely hypothetical. Let's say you mostly shoot a compound bow, pretty much all the time. That's all you've ever shot. So you're Mark. Yeah, and, but you <laughs> want to get a lot better. You got a lot of room to get better with uh, a recurve or self bow. Are you? Is doing one gonna like mess with the other? Like, oh, like good are you? Question. A, Good question. I don't, I wouldn't think so. I mean, like I said, the fundamentals, if you're shooting your compound the way that you, you should be, uh, the fundamentals are going to be the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, back tension, even with a compound bow, is, is important. It's probably less important because you have all these things to, to, um, <laughs> we have we have another conversation going. We're on we're um, on a working horse ranch. Here. We are we are. Um, you have all those things to kind of mitigate for um, for your your inputs into the shot. Mm -hmm. um, well, I imagine too, like thinking about let off, right? Like even though, like I probably can get a lot better at using back tension with my compound, but I imagine I need like less of not less of it but like less strength maybe even perhaps because you're holding less at full draw yeah it's definitely it's definitely a different set of muscles that you need to 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 go through your entire draw on a on a recurve versus a compound because a, a compound like you the when when you first you're, you're you you're improving but when you first started shooting this bow it's like you're drawing down Mm -hmm. And I imagine that's the way you, you draw your compounds. You draw down and then you come up. Is that basically it? Or I you... mean, I try with my bow, like I think I got it set at 60. And I try, like, yeah, probably a little. I mean, it's not like a crazy sky draw or anything, but it's probably at just a little bit of an upward angle. I try to get it back as straight as possible, yeah. though. But, you know. But I don't think, uh, you know, back to the question, I don't think that it's going to impede your progress uh you know if you switch back and forth um i i think that you know if you're serious about it though if you're serious about going traditional and and uh, you know really giving it your all i mean i think you ought to just make the commitment and go for it just go for it if anything it'll just make you continue to realize that living la vida trad life is better I was, I was talking to my brother-in-law this morning. I'm like, dude, this amazing trip. We made these awesome bows. I'm like, and he's a big whitetail hunter. And he's like, uh, I'm like, dude, I, th I think I'm going to start hunting with this thing. He's like, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you're hunting marginal public land at best. Now you're going to add a self bow into the mix? I'm like, I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> we, we should do it, Mark. Um, now, uh, talking about, too, like, getting getting used to the fundamentals of shooting with with a bow in general but also just some of the unique oddities of the traditional bow um we were doing some tuning of the bows when we first got them set up uh, and so we we put our strings on these things and we were trying to figure out you've got this kit of different arrows that have different uh different spines to them different weighted uh tips i was about to say heads for some reason uh anyway we were just going to run some of those different arrows through the bows, and we were going to see how they were performing, how their flight looked th through the air. And um, I think we should talk about that a little bit. But the, the one um, thing that you brought up towards the end is Mark and I had just been sending endless amounts of arrows into a hay bale. <laughs> is It's pretty difficult to get a bow really well tuned when you're still not totally sure exactly what you're doing shooting them. Because... You got to have some level of consistency where you're only changing one variable, you know, that way you can see, okay, when I change the variable this much, this happened and you know that it was the variable that changed that mm -hmm. downrange. And it wasn't, it wasn't that, oh, well this time Jimmy didn't get full, fully aligned, you know, he kind of yep. stopped short. Um, and so that was one of the difficult things. I think we got these things about as tuned as we could get them, but there's probably even as we continue to get better and better, we could probably get them tuned a little bit better just because we'll start getting more consistent. Um, I guess before we get into the tuning thing, I was going to ask, like, for somebody just starting to shoot traditional bow, is it best that, I mean, this goes for like any kind of bow to compound, whatever, is it best that they just kind of like pick one up and start shooting and try and figure stuff out, watch YouTube videos like yours, but just for the most part, just be shooting a lot? 
Or should they try and find somewhere to take a lesson, find someone who's more of a professional to look at their form and give them a few critiques? Because, like, is it pretty easy to develop, like, bad habits over time that are just tough to get rid of? Yes, definitely. It's it's, it's very easy to develop bad habits. Um, and if you have the means to, uh, you know, take a professional lesson or, or something like that with somebody who really knows what they're talking about, absolutely. I mean, you can cut your learning curve down. Uh, avoid some pitfalls and things like that. Um, and then I think the second best thing is to to get on YouTube and, and watch some good videos. Um, but the big thing is just don't like there's so much information and, and you can you can dive deep into this. Don't get overwhelmed. Just get a bow, go out, shoot some arrows, have fun. And, you know, don't get frustrated that you will get frustrated, but try, you know, just, just go out and have fun and don't try to figure everything out before you start. You're never going to do that. Yeah. You know, you're going to, you need to just get a bow and, and, and start flinging some arrows and have fun. Um, and as far as tuning this stuff goes and how tuning and like your shooting technique kind of play off of one another, um, you can get a bow and arrow that's roughly matched. And that's, you don't need to like worry about like having it perfectly tuned. Uh, it'll shoot just fine and you can group arrows. And then once you start dialing in your form and getting your alignment and your, and your consistency built up, then you can start uh, thinking about, you know, really trying to tune that bow uh, so that you're getting perfect arrow flight. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know for me, Jim, like I'm taking a lot of these shots here and I've got so, you know, just inconsistency between the shots, right? But then mm -hmm. also like some intentionally induced inconsistency because you're like, oh, okay, the string hit my arm that time. Well, I'll adjust this or I'll work on my grip on this shot and really think about that or, you know, you know, try and get your, but so like you said, you're changing things every time trying to figure out that, that sweet spot. And yeah. yeah. So like Clay said, you get it, get it tuned pretty good and then. Yeah. Just go. Now, how about that tuning process? So, like I said, yeah, different arrows that we were running through these. You were also, throughout the course of the tuning process, especially on mine, uh, we were changing brace height and knock height. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, um, brace height being, well, I'll let you explain what those are because I'm not going to be able to explain it as well. But what, what things are you looking at and what are you changing when you're tuning one of these? Yeah, so the, the, one of the big things that we do is I have a, a test kit of arrows that has uh, different spined arrows, so different stiffness of the shaft, uh, all the way from, you know, wood arrows are a little bit different than the carbon arrows. Um, so for wood arrows, it'd be every, you know, everything from 40, 45 to on up to, I think it has some 80, 85 shafts in there, which is really stiff. And so for a carbon, that'd be like a, like a 600 spine all the way up to like a, what's the two, two, some 250, sure. 300, something like that. Cool. I'm not nearly as familiar with carbon, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, li like a flexible shaft versus a very stiff shaft. Um, and so, and they also have different tip weights on them. So I have some with 160 grains and I have some with 190 grains. And so you just shoot a bunch of arrows through there and see what flies out of that bow with that shooter the best. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're not going to get something that's perfect if you don't have your form dialed in, but you can get close enough uh, to get it pretty well matched. Uh, once you've, uh, you know, kind of in conjunction with that, you're, you're looking at your brace height, which is the measurement from your string to the deepest part of your handle. Um, and it, you don't want it to be too high because then you have more stress on the bow than this is you know, something that's specific to wooden bows. It's just more, it's harder on the bow because it's being held into that uh, yeah. tighter, tighter um, radius. Even just at rest. Yep. Um, and then you also have a less efficient bow. Uh, on the other end of that spectrum, if you ha if your brace height is too low, uh, it can create issues with tuning. Um, it can cause things, uh, you know, issues with wrist slap, things like that. So you got to find somewhere in the middle that you get a decent tuned arrow. You don't, you're not slapping yourself every time. Um, and then, you need to worry about your your knock height. So how far above your rest, your your actual arrow knock knock point on your string is placed. Um, and we were playing around with that a little bit yesterday, trying to get like good level flight. So you want to try to avoid a knock high flight or a knock low flight. You want that thing coming off there uh, nice and flat. And so you can 
you can mess around with that to to try and find that mm-hmm. that that perfect flight there off there off Mark, the shelf. Marks took like three shots, and we already found an arrow combination and tip combination that shot like a dart. Yeah. And then mine, we were fiddling around with a lot, and we ended up raising the brace height up quite a bit. By in in order to raise the brace height, we were twisting the string more. Yeah. Um. So we'd unstring it, twist the string more, and put it back on, and. We were changing that knock height around a little bit, and it seems like we got something that's pretty good. Luckily, Mark and I actually shoot the same arrow and uh, and tip setup, yeah. which is nice. We can bum each other's arrows. Although <laughs> yeah. I know Mark doesn't like people to touch his arrows, so I probably won't. <laughs> uh, very, very touchy about no, that. Yeah, no touchy, Jim. Um, so, but that was uh, that was pretty cool. And, and I, both Mark and I asked, I think at least, if not multiple times, at least once. Well, Clay, why don't you just shoot this thing? Then, then you can you'll take out all the errors that we're putting in. Then we'll we'll see how the arrow flies through. We'll know exactly what it's supposed to shoot. But you said it doesn't really work like that. No, it's it, it really depends on the shooter and the bow, like that 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 pair. You know, I can't tune your bow. I can tune it to me, but then when you pick it up, it's it's probably going to shoot differently. Hmm. And you know, to add to that, these bows in particular are. It, it was carved out of a twisty, crooked hunk of wood. And so every one of these bows is a little bit different. And so sometimes it can be a little bit different, difficult to find, fine tune those things perfectly because you got to fiddle with all these little different things because that is an individual. There's no other bow in, like that in the world. Sure. But if you fiddle with it enough, you can find something that, that'll fly absolutely perfectly out of that thing. For you, like let's say you made three bows, which I'm sure you've made three bows in your life, but you had three bows and they're they're essentially set up for you. Yeah. Would you would they be close enough? Like you said, they're all made out of different trees, possibly multiple trees, if you've got, you know, a two piece. Would they all shoot about the same or would you have to get used to each one a little bit as well? They all I can I can pick up my you know, I can shoot this bow and then I can pick up one of my other bows that's a similar weight and they'll shoot pretty doggone close mm-hmm. close enough that i'd feel good hunting with them you know big game anyway mm-hmm. got it okay um man we were talking about tuning and it, it had me thinking about something else that i'm trying to remember on but uh i feel like i had a good one too jim that i lost it flew away oh you know what it happens doesn't you it gotta start <laughs> keeping a notepad man i know we should it's hard to do though when we're on these sweet stave masters <laughs> They're so comfy. I think that's the problem is we're too comfortable. We got foot rests. We got these boat chairs to sit back in with the with the padding. I can, I can find a rasp around here somewhere you can sit on. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, it'd be the most uh, it'd be the most on point interview. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, tuning these things though has been fun. Then, like we said, we went out. We did some stump shooting today. And uh, which is kind of a misnomer. The, 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 let's let's the, talk about the, the term misnomer stump, of stump shooting because I've I've heard it all my life, but we, it's it, it's like I said a little bit of a misnomer. Probably a term, possibly a term made up by arrow manufacturers, <laughs> trying to have people bust up some arrows so they can sell some more. But you kind of gave you kind of talked about it in a, in a different way. So what, although commonly referred to as stump shooting, maybe not what you want to be doing, Clay. If you have a nice hardwood. Uh, forest where there's some like really nice rotted soft stumps those things are are perfect to shoot at but I don't have that here so we just walk through the fields and find some dried up cow patties and use those <laughs> yeah so it doesn't have to be a stump um, Mark did manage to find one that was semi-green though and coat an arrow with some <laughs> nice cow yeah you prefer <laughs> a, uh, a dry a fully dry cow fully patty dry. Fully dry. Um, but, but, I mean, we were shooting at thistles, you know, oh, sticks, yeah. cow patties. Yeah, pretty much anything that catches your eye. Yeah. yeah. A wide variety. Um, but ton of fun. is like the most fun walk you could ever think of taking through a pasture. And, uh, yeah, you just walk around, you find stuff, you try and shoot at it. We were doing little ranging guessing games where we had a rangefinder with us trying to estimate what distance we thought something was at. Um, got a little bit better as time went on, but you know, it's, that, that can be difficult, but that's, that's a skill that's nice to have when you're out in the woods or wherever you're at. Um, cause sometimes stuff happens quick. You gotta be able to know what distance it's at. Well, and we all started with one arrow and it ended with one arrow. With one arrow. Yeah. So it's like the cheapest fun that you can have too. I mean, of, of course you got to get the bone, you got to get the arrow and stuff, but otherwise you don't need anything else. You just go out and you just shoot at whatever you see. And it, I mean... It makes for, aside from if you got like a really nice 3D 
uh, course set up. It makes for some realistic-ish, unless you're doing long bombs like we were just for that heck of it, but makes for some realistic type scenarios, shots, angles. Um, you know, we put ourselves in, uh, at one point, a tight position around a branch, trying to shoot between a couple of branches at, at a cow pie that was approximately at turkey distance. Um, but stuff like that, it, it, it was pretty fun. And I feel like I got a lot better doing it than I would be if I was just kind of standing in the same spot over and over, shooting at a hay bale with a target on it, you know. It just felt more natural. Well, it's so much easier to, like, you're talking about a 3D course, which is excellent practice, and, like, you know, the life like animals, you know, we're talking about sight pictures and getting used to that and naming. I mean, that's definitely, like, a, a huge thing that, you know, is great to do. But, I mean, you could change the course at will, like, super fast. Like, oh, I'm going to pick that out instead, or we'll go over here. Um, and, Clay, you were saying there's kind of like a, like, people do almost like a, a golf type. Oh yeah, yeah, archery golf. Um, it's, it's great fun when you get a couple of guys together. And, you know, you got your long shots, so you can get sail it in somewhere close, and then you just whoever can get to hit the target in the fewest number of arrows, they get that hole. Yeah, but Heck yeah, uh, a lot some similarities in golf too. I'm not a great golfer, Jim. I don't know if you <laughs> do that, but um, like when you're shoot like when. Even when you're not a good golfer, like you, you, you finally like get that swing and connect, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was perfect, you know. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, you're analyzing, okay, so what was different about that shot? What was the, you know, okay, how was I holding this? That I feel the same way when I'm shooting this bow. It's like, oh, okay, that arrow flight was better. Okay, so what happened that time? Or you know, that, my release felt good. So what was I doing different? Or I felt more aligned. Or I don't know, there's there's a lot to analyze, and I think that that is part of the fun of it. And like we said, a, a not like golf thing, though, is, like I said, we started with one arrow and ended with one arrow, and I never <laughs> start and end with the same golf ball. I thought you were going to say a not golf-like thing is that it was, like, super fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was somebody my just like, Somebody just rage quit right there and <laughs> threw their radio out the car. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> but uh mark you brought up earlier um today i noticed you didn't have your arm guard on Mm -hmm. you're wearing a sweatshirt so that kind of helped out yep um but clay the arm guards finger tabs stuff like that some of the equipment that goes around the bows um i know you don't really seem to use an arm guard a lot i think you uh you do use finger tabs what's uh I feel like arm guard for certain is fairly self-explanatory, but explain those, what they're used for, why one might use them versus not use them. Well, and I don't use an arm guard because I don't have a tendency to, the string doesn't have a tendency to hit my arm, just the way that I grip my bow. Um, but a lot of people do, just the way they, they grip their bow and, and some very good shooters, uh, a lot of very good shooters are, are you know, will have an arm guard. Um but like I said, I just don't use one. Uh, I do use a finger tab. Uh, I shoot three under. Uh, a glove is also another option. And a lot of people shoot gloves. Um, but a finger tab for me is something that, you know, I, uh, it, it's easy. I can stick it in my pocket. Uh, I can make them myself. Uh, I've got some slick cordovan leather, which is like a, a horse hide leather. It's very, very slick. Uh, that I make my tabs out of, um, and it just works works good. But that just simply guards your, you know, protects your fingers because these things, you know, if you're shooting a 50 or 60 pound bow, they, it's rough on bare fingers. It'll mm-hmm. eat you up. Yeah. Uh, what, what about you know? You're talking about gloves. Um, it was actually pretty chilly here this morning. Yeah. I think you guys even had a little bit of a frost. Yeah, there was a light frost this morning. Yeah, sorry, we brought it down with us. I tell you, what? I know. Well, yeah. Can you do? <laughs> Um, when I first shot this morning, my hands were cold yeah. and I was like, Ooh, that had a little, even with the, uh, the finger tab had a little bit more zip to it. Uh, you know, as far as, uh, in the fingertips a little there. Bite to the bone, mm-hmm. do you on a cold weather hunt, do you wear gloves, not wear a glove? How do how do you handle that? I might have like a thin wool, like a glove liner on my bow hand. Uh-huh. Uh, but on my string hand, I don't have anything except for my, uh, except for my, shooting tab okay savage Um, and i you know so i keep my hands in my pockets a lot until i'm absolutely ready to shoot but there's those times you know when you're you've got an animal there and he's you're having to wait and so yeah it can get kind of tough when you're single digits waiting on an animal to step into the right position so that you can shoot oof 
And then you said you shoot, so you shoot three under. Yep. That's that's describing your index, your middle, and your ring finger being oh. underneath the yep. uh, knock mm-hmm. of the arrow on the string. Um, like the old classic way I remember seeing on TV before I started shooting traditional bow that I thought I would end up shooting like was uh, split finger, right? Yeah, yeah. Where that index finger goes above the knock, and the other two are below it. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between them? Any preference? I guess you have a preference, but why? Yeah, I, so I shot split finger uh, for a long time because, like you said, that's f- that's all I ever saw people doing. Um, and so I just thought that's the way that we were supposed to do it. The reason that I switched, or I actually switched when I started aiming, uh, because by shooting three under, the arrow, I can get the arrow closer underneath my eye. Okay. Oh. And so that helps with aiming. Got it. Yeah, yeah I think you mentioned, you. I tried split finger once, you said your, your hold under is going to be a little bit lower. Oh yeah, a lot lower actually. Okay. And so that's, that, that and it's, unless you try it, it might not make perfect sense, but when you... When you uh, shoot split finger, you're basically lowering your knock, which increases your launch angle. Like it puts the arrow at a, at a at a tilt upward. Gotcha. And so to compensate for that, you have to then move your bow down, which ends up with a very large gap if you're gap shooting. Got yeah, it. it's like starting out with just like a higher trajectory. Yeah, your launch angle is like pointed up like this. So so to hit something, you actually have to like lower your bow down. Mm-hmm. And with that. You know, with the finger tab and three under, when I started out, I was actually running my fingers all the way up Mm -hmm. to the knock of the arrow. But you actually, uh, I guess, corrected that for me and are just a little bit below that. So you're not necessarily putting any, you know, I guess, upward finger pressure on the knock. Yeah, I, you know, you can slide your finger all the way up to the knock. But personally, I found it to be a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more accurate to slide your finger just a little bit so that you're not putting any pressure on that arrow knock okay yeah. i don't know why that is but I th- it must have something to do with uh you know just an inconsistent pressure on the arrow when you're when you're drawing when your fingers right up against that thing yeah how should guys like us go back <laughs> home and practice like what's should we i mean should we just be i'm definitely gonna go around stump shooting a lot yeah but I mean, is that is that just the best form of practice there is, or or should we be doing something where we're doing? Are there like some drills or something that you like to do that are really good for getting yourself just in the right mindset, the right technique, right cons- level of consistency? Yeah, well, I mean, stump shooting is is great fun, um, but like if you are serious about improving your form, yeah, um, like I want to shoot a deer, like or it, multiple, yes. Yeah. Like getting your like getting good alignment, um, filming yourself is it's great because you can see exactly what you're doing, and there's a couple of angles that you can use to to show what you're doing. You know, one straight behind you so that you can see the alignment of your elbow, and another really good angle is if you can get a camera pointed straight down on top of you. Oh. Because that'll show the alignment from your bow through your bow arm through your shoulders to your back to your drawing elbow, and ideally you want a, a, a per, you want a triangle. You want that this line from this shoulder or yeah from your bow arm through your shoulder. You want that to be a straight line. You're gonna have a little bit of a pivot point, a little bit of an angle right here, because you can't draw all the way back and get perfect alignment because your string's gonna go try to go through your chest you have no clearance right and so you have to tilt this elbow out a little bit and then the other leg of that triangle is your forearm running straight down through that arrow got it so yeah you don't want to add in any other angles anywhere else and a big thing mark that you need to work on is you create another angle right here at your drawing hand so you're you're oh sure yeah like it's kind of like coming out here and then back again. Yeah, so your your arrow's coming this way and then your your forearm is at an angle to that. So ideally that would be in line with your arrow and just simply through rotating around your body, that's how you get that arrow in close to your face and under your eye. Mm. That's probably happening because you're bringing that bicep in yep. a mm-hmm. fair amount. Yeah. That's the only way to really do it is to engage that bicep because you're drawing like this and your elbow is pointed out that way instead of back the way it needs to be. Yeah. Gotcha. I found myself doing a lot of collapsing 
like I wasn't getting fully aligned. I was kind of bringing it back here and then just kind of stopping just short, which then was sending a lot of stuff to the right, I found. Yeah. The, f- the filming yourself thing was the thing that I wanted to touch on. So thank you, Clay. We, we, we got that. We was, found that it. Was, that was the thing that I, that I forgot. Now, and then honestly, sat on a rasp. you know, admittedly with the bow that we built here, which I'm in, lo- it's, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm super proud of this bow and, and the work that I was able to put into it. Well, obviously with a lot of help from Clay. So like, this is an amazing thing, but I think I'm a little bit over boat with this one yeah. right now. So what about, you know, we're talking about form and consistent consistency. Is it a good idea for folks to start off with a lower poundage bow so they can kind of get those things nailed down and then hopefully eventually get, get here? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's one of the biggest problems, uh, especially with guys coming from co- the compound world is because they're used to shooting a 60 pound compound. So they say, well, you know, they think they should be able to shoot a 60 pound or even a 50 pound uh, recurve or a longbow and they can shoot it. But when you're trying to figure out your form, um, and you're shooting a heavy bow like that, you're, you, a lot of times you're struggling against the bow just to get it to full draw. Um, and that's, it makes it difficult to find that the, the, the way that good form feels. And so what I, and it's not always practical to get a bow just to practice with but if you can and a lot of times you can find cheap recurves you know if you can get a 30 or a 35 pound bow that is absolutely perfect for working on your form because you can get that thing back you can adjust things you can fiddle with it at full draw you can hold it back yeah you can try out different anchor points you know you can try all kinds of different things and you can shoot it for a long time Um, so if you can, I'd say definitely get a lightweight bow and that you're, you're going to be so far ahead, uh, if you do that. It would be nice to have the, like, you know, even so we're keeping up, we're shooting it, but like getting fatigued Mm -hmm. and then you get frustrated and you want to keep shooting, but you shouldn't because you're fatigued and, uh, and yeah, having a lighter bow would be nice in that regard. Well, Well, I could even tell, I mean, you guys are definitely, I think, you know, somewhat similar bows, but at least from what I can tell, you guys were getting a lot more velocity out of your arrows than I was, you know. Hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, just like you said, just getting that bow back all the way back in that proper form, I think that's going to be my biggest thing to work on. I do have at my house, Jim, a, uh, you know, you talk about getting a bow for not that much money. I've got an old bear uh, recurve laminate bow, and I think it's a 40. It's oh, a 40 perfect. pound. Yeah, that'll so do. I think I'll be... F- Fiddling with that, but this is this should, is where I'm trying to get. We should just have some of those uh, for in, for the time being, just at work. Yeah, just set up some targets. Just bring it in right around the office. Sounds like a l- good lunch break activity. Oh <laughs> heck yeah! <laughs> well, we've got lunches like, planned. How many for lunches the... have these guys had today? <laughs> or, or brunch? You know, whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> lunch lunch ran a, a little long today. Uh, <laughs> um, boy, and not to be sort of all over the place. I just there's so much to talk about. I'm trying to hit it, but. Um, Clay, I mean, obviously we're building these bows. I mean, we want to go hunting with them. You hunt with them all the time. Um, some of the, some of the uniqueness of these bows is how you can use them in a hunting situation. I mean, first off, um, let's talk about, you like to build these things tough, uh, and their tools. You were mentioning they're very multi-purpose. You use yours as a, uh, and, and I'm sure to the compound guys out there listening, I know at least Mark, who's a little bit. A little bit finicky with his equipment. <laughs> um, use yours as a walking stick. Walking that, that, stick. That uh, might make people an, cringe. An arrow rake, a uh, monopod, uh, you know, use it for all sorts of different things. Yeah, stick your binos on top. Yeah. It, they sit almost... Snake swatter. Per- yeah, snake swatter. For a guy our height, I mean, we're all pretty similar height, they sit almost perfectly when you stand them up unstrung. Or even, no, when they, they are strung. strung yeah. When they are strung up... Uh, Perfect height for a monopod for binos. You stick the hinge right in on the top of the knock and glass for glass for a while. Yeah. Off you go. Off you go. What about because Jim and I like we want to hunt with these things. Like that's my ultimate goal to like get good at shooting it, you know, be consistent enough that I feel like I've got, you know, at least somewhat of a decent effective range. What are some things for people to be thinking about? Like I want to hunt with like a re a recurve or a self bow or something like that get used to the idea that you're not going to 
you're not going to fill as many tags for one thing. Um, you know, if you, if you are comfortable shooting a whitetail at 35 or 40 yards with a compound, you know, you might cut that distance in half. And you think about your time in the woods, like how many deer do you have within 40 yards versus how many do you have within 20? I mean, there's a lot more opportunities at those longer ranges just because yep. your probability of getting close is, is much more. Um, but I mean, the, 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 there's some advantages too. you know, they're light, they're lightweight. They don't weigh much. Oh my they're, gosh. Yeah. They're incredibly simple. You know, if, uh, I usually carry an extra bowstring in my pack, I've never had to use one, but you know, let's say you bring a, bring a broadhead out of your, uh, out of your quiver and you get a little careless and cut a bowstring. Well, you do that on a compound and your hunt's over, right? You're going back to town. Uh, with one of these things, you just pull another bowstring out and away you go. Yeah, you could just yeah string it in the field. I like you had a you have your bow square thing, yep. which you can just stick on the string, make sure your brace height and your knock height are right, and you're off to the races. Yeah, and I mean, you don't even really have to have that. You ha- you set your uh, you set your knock height beforehand, mm-hmm. and then uh, if you have a mark on your arrow that corresponds with a mark on your bow riser. That's that's how you get your brace height. Then you don't even have to have a bow square. Yep. How about that? And the bow square only weighed like two ounces, anyways. That is pretty slick. I and like the I like the fact that uh, also he's talking about advantages. Positional shooting is is very natural with these. Yeah. There's not a whole lot that changes or gets really weird. You know, like if you're Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're shooting a compound. It, do do you have to consider the fact that obviously you're you're accounting for drop with your slider and these pins and all that stuff? So if you changed your angle, you've effectively it's like changing the angle of shooting a, a rifle scope. You know, if you have your rifle super candid, you're changing the optic over bore height, kind of. Like, can you shoot a compound like super sideways or? I mean, I don't think so. I've never tried it. I mean, I've shot from you know from sitting and kneeling and things like that, but I think I'm always very vertical, I guess, or as vertical as I as I can be in those positions. Yeah. These make it a lot more able to get a little more sideways, get under stuff mm-hmm. or over something or whatever and and it ultimately doesn't change. When you full draw, you can still use that arrow exactly how you're using it if you're more straight up and down, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I like if I get super like I I did a video, I don't know, 2 years ago uh where I was showing like uh how you could actually sh- you, you can make shots with these that you can't make with a compound. You can shoot over things because of the trajectory and mm-hmm. you can shoot under things. Like, uh, I had a couple of hay bales stacked up and I was actually shooting on through a gap that was like this big, you know, shooting underneath that. And the bow's completely, you know, laid flat on the ground, almost just a few inches from the ground. Like when you really tilt it over heavy like that, like I have to change my anchor point. I have to move to the side of my eye because in my eye, there's no way to get my eye over the top of the arrow. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to do that. You can just uh, you can realize that your you know your eyes now in a plane like this, and just make those adjustments to the target. Okay, and but that's you, such an extreme scenario. Too. Oh yeah, I mean, you're, I was doing it just for the video. Yeah. Right, a little proof of concept. Yeah, got it. But yeah, when we were shooting out of that little chair there between those branches at our turkey cow pie. Then you can get a little get a little angle on it. You can get a little move around somewhat, and ultimately the shot ended up being. I mean, I just once once was in position, just visualized it as though I was standing up, comfortable mm-hmm. as could be. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to look back at the video on that and see if I kind of subconsciously made some adjustments there. I don't know. It's fun. It was fun. It was a ton of fun. It's definitely you know you shoot and you just want to keep shooting or like you miss and so you want to try it again and i don't know yeah it's uh you know i i mentioned that uh you know you're probably not going to fill as many tags with these things just because it's it's not as easy to get that close you know as it is to to you know get to within 40 or 50 yards of an animal but you know one of the the big things that people overlook is the sense of accomplishment Mm -hmm. you know yeah um, when you can, you know, even just, just going traditional with a, with a laminated longbow or a recurve, 
uh, the sense of accomplishment that you get when everything comes together. You know, you put in the work, you put in the time, not only to be able to shoot your bow, but to be able to get that close to the animal. And when things come together, it's it's truly amazing. But when you can, you know, take it to this level and go out into the woods, chop down a tree, make a bow, learn to shoot that bow, and then go take an animal with that, that's that's pretty freaking awesome. It's amazing. It is. I mean, getting getting any animal with whatever, you know, weapon you choose is always, like, in my opinion, like, super fulfilling, and there's so much to it. But I guess I'll throw a butt in there. Like, you know, I'll, I'll hunt Wisconsin, and I'll, like, I'll pass does with my compound, you know, waiting for the big buck, Jim. Uh, with this thing, I'd be, like, if I oh, yeah. killed a doe, like, oh, yeah. I'd be cloud nine. And just I think it just goes to show, like, how contextual – things are as far as um like you said that level of accomplishment and that'd be i mean it's always a big deal but that'd be a big deal and Mm -hmm. that that's that's a great point um like i don't i don't do a lot of rifle hunting and i'm not i've never been a, a big trophy hunter but i understand like why uh people hunt with compounds and rifles like why they wait for those big bucks you know it, you know if they were just to shoot the first animal that comes out they'd be their hunting season would be over or, or whatever their, their yeah. tag would be burned um but the little bit that i've done of you know hunting like that it's like you never you very rarely get the feeling like now i'm hunting like because you don't ever see that animal right he's very rare like uh if you're hunting a 160 inch buck the odds of seeing that animal and then like being actually pursuing that animal is very rare. Right. Mm -hmm. But with this, I don't like, like you said, with the does, it elevates every animal to like trophy status. And so a spike or a doe whitetail or something like that, you see those things all the time. And so it's like, I'm, I'm more actively hunting more often yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? No, it's yeah. like it's always on. Oh, yeah. Like, every time it's like, well, this could be my only shot. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I love like that. I love all of hunting. But it's like that part where it's like that animal right there. Yeah, it's game on. Yeah. I'm trying to get that one. I mm-hmm. mean, for lack of a better, like, this is going to sound, whatever. However, it's, it's this is how it's going to sound because this is how it's going to come out. But like. <laughs> When you get in, when you, whether it's rifle or whatever, like there is like a point where you're like, you get into kill mode. Yeah. And like, like you said, like you are hunting, like it is on. And like you said, Clay, you're getting into that mode, at least for me right now, every time I see a legal animal. Yes. Exactly. Absolutely. That seems cool. Yeah. Absolutely. It is cool. <laughs> and I'm not a big, don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm not a big passer of animals. Like I'm, I'm definitely not to that point. Like. But you know, uh, it, it does happen. You, you know. can you can try your absolute best to kill every legal animal you see, and still get to hunt a lot. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. There's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, gosh, it, 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 it does remind me. But going back to that Arizona hunt on that coos when I stalked that one in with my traditional bow, and got as close as I did to it. And even though I missed, you know, it's just it's still the fact of getting as close as I did to one of those things was pretty pretty off the charts i mean i was over the moon about that but i remember thinking like i mean had i have hit that thing i'd have been doing backflips cartwheels through the cactus everything wouldn't have even cared and uh it's just it, it was funny because then i go back and i talk to some people i'm i'm like saying everything about how crazy that hunt was how that stock was and some people be like oh was it a pretty big one and i'm like doesn't oh, matter i literally <laughs> did, it never Dude. even occurred to me the size i knew it had antlers on it because that was what i could hunt but I, the rest never even thought about it. And I had to go back and think, I'd be like, uh, I don't know. I mean, it had a had a rack on top. Some people, there, there, there's there's a type of person that will get that, and then there's a type of person that just will never understand that. Yeah. You know? I can't blame them. I don't know. I mean, it's just what what they're used to. They probably heard it, too, a bunch of times, like shoot something or whatever, and say, how big was it? It's yeah. like, I, mean, I guess that just is what it is. I don't, I don't have an issue with people trying to hunt big animals. But, man, I... I was stoked, uh, even on that. It definitely, it definitely takes that like on-off, yes/no switch, and and uh, as with the bow, it just simplifies things. Yeah, yeah. Man, the idea of going out though, chopping something down yourself in the woods, 
making something out of it and then returning to the woods to then go harvest something is is pretty wild yeah it is it's a it's huge sense of accomplishment mark it sounds to me like um, this might not even be your last bow. You're already talking about making other bows, hickory bows, elm bows. I mean, I'm 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 a little bit. You're gonna get one. I'm of these a little things. bit inspired, so we'll see we'll see what uh, what time allows, Jim. But I mean, Clay, definitely. I mean, this has been an absolutely amazing experience, Clay. Thank you for spending so much time with us, you know, and and going through this process with us and helping us and showing us so many things and helping us learn to shoot these things. Uh, I can probably get better at uh, stringing and unstringing. Uh, I'll just get it out there. I, 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 I hit myself in the face yesterday. It may be on video. I just I know Jim's not gonna let it n- not see the light of day. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rip the bandaid off myself. Wow. Uh, you can probably keep your eyes peeled for that. Everybody. We've really reached like a new point, huh? I, I gave up, Jim, because I know you'll just do it. Oh, maybe now we won't do it. Maybe now the fun's gone. <laughs> but we uh, finally figured it out. But yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, part of the challenge and, and just this whole process. It just, it really is so cool. And and like we talked about earlier, like, I mean, we actually did a lot of this process, right? But, you know, the finer points, probably the more critical points, you know, Clay took the reins, which yeah, I was I no, was happy for. I, I, I know turn back points. only thing that I did was, was if, if you started to get off track a little bit, I just maybe made a few scrapes and kind of got you back between the lines. And away you went. I, I did very, very little on those bows. But uh Which makes him feel so much better. It does. It's I love, cool. You I know love mine. And I, I you know, I'm I'm definitely uh, probably a little bit more uh tentative than you, Jim, when it comes to something like this. You're generally a little bit more <laughs> well, more full sin. Uh <laughs> <laughs> got me in a got me in a hairy situation a time or two, but uh, yeah, yeah, super cool and yeah, just was asking Clay earlier. I mean, we talked about different woods and different woods that you know grow different places, and I think we got a fair amount of hickory in our yeah. area, which sounds like you can make a pretty good bow. Uh, I think we covered earlier that it sounds like that hickory you can dry out a lot quicker yeah. than Osage, yeah. and, and so kind of you know get through that process and some some intricacies with that type of wood that are that differ from the Osage, but. Uh, yeah, no, Jim, I I have been thinking about where I uh you know, fit one of these in the garage and, you know, you can make it happen. We can make it happen. We can make, you can make anything happen. So, it makes uh, I, I like to hear that when when somebody's going to go home and and use what they learned to to start making their own bows. But you'll learn. I like you'll go home and you'll get started on your the first one you do by yourself and you'll be like, "What?" How, what was what oh, was he wait. saying? What how I mm-hmm. Clay's not here do to this. Clay's not here to save me. <laughs> but you you and, just go for it, just, and you'll learn. Yeah, you know, and this one, like, I really like. I mean, I guess you'd always care, right? But like, I really cared about this one. I mean, I I, I, I want like I wanted to leave this experience with a bow that like Clay would be proud of, you know. And uh, but I feel like with one that I was just doing myself, I'd be less afraid well and also i wanted to have a, a bow to finish up this pod venture i didn't want to you know be like well mine broke well, you, didn't you didn't want to boats, um, boats and bow this one yeah i didn't want to boats and bows this one but like with the other one like i think i'd be like well i'm just gonna do this and see how that goes you know um yeah. and if you know whatever happens happens hopefully it doesn't explode in your face well, both of you did a did a very good job ended up with some pr- pretty nice bows no these they're, i mean they're they're thank spectacular you. so yes thank you clay very much that's cool Absolutely. Self bows. Everybody make you one. Yep. Try and it. if you're interested or have, you know, I mean, so many questions or things that we've talked about, Clay, I mean, you've you've covered on your on your YouTube channel, tons of great content there. So, yeah, yep. definitely don't hesitate to jump over there. And uh, if you are so inspired. Absolutely. Right on. Clay, anything else to close it out? Uh, not that I can think of. Had a good time having you guys here. It's time to go uh, see if we can catch a shark. Oh, yeah. We'll try and do that, too. We'll let you guys know if we do that. If you don't hear anything, though, we didn't, or we got eaten by a great white. (laughs) Hopefully you hear from us. Yes. Uh, Cool. So with that said, we will bid yet another pod venture adieu. As usual, comment on the YouTube videos in the comment section. Also, check out. We're going to have a whole bunch of video going along with this, the camera guy Cooper shot. So you're going to want to check that out. Do the whole like, subscribe thing. You know, everybody's saying it these days on YouTube, so I'll say it. And, uh, yeah, let us know if you're going to build a self bow or yeah. if you have built one. Send us some pictures. I don't know. Do all that sort of thing. Thank you, as usual, for watching and listening, and we'll see you on the next one.
Bye, Peace everyone. Out. Bye, everybody. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.